In the village of Zango, there was a woman named Salima. She was as poor as the dusty ground beneath her feet. Her clothes were like old rags, full of holes and tears, barely covering her body. Her hut? It was more of a shell than a home. The roof leaked whenever the sky cried, and the cold wind blew through the torn windows as if mocking her. Salima had no bed. She slept on the hard, bare floor, curling up like a hungry cat to keep warm. Every night, she prayed for a better life, but the mornings always greeted her with the same struggle. She tried everything to survive. She fetched water for people, washed their clothes, and even worked on their farms. But no matter how hard she worked, her hands always came back empty. It was as if the world had turned its back on her. Her age mates, the women she grew up with, were all married, living comfortably with their families. They wore fine clothes, their children laughing and playing around them. But Salima, she had no husband, no child, no one to call her own. The villagers whispered behind her back. She's cursed, they said, born with bad luck. Even the men kept their distance, fearing her misfortune would rub off on them. Salima's life was a tale of sorrow. She walked through the village like a shadow, unnoticed, unloved, and unwanted. Yet, despite everything, she carried on, hoping that one day the sun would shine brighter on her life. But that day had not come, not yet. One hot afternoon, Salima carried her bundle of tattered clothes to the river. The sun beat down fiercely and the river sparkled like a pot of melted silver. She knelt by the water, scrubbing her rags with hands as rough as the village roads. The sound of the rushing water was the only comfort she had. As Salima washed, she heard the soft rustle of footsteps behind her. She turned quickly her heart skipping like a frightened bird. There, standing tall and proud, was a woman dressed in clothes so fine they seemed to belong to a queen. Her skin glowed, her jewelry sparkled, and her smile was as sharp as a knife. Good day, the woman said, her voice smooth like honey. Salima blinked, unsure if she was dreaming. Good day, ma, she replied, her voice barely above a whisper. The woman stepped closer. My name is Kemi. I've been watching you, Salima. I know your struggles. Salima's eyes widened. How did this stranger know her name? Kemi smiled, as if reading her thoughts. I have a business for you. It's simple and will change your life. Salima stared, her mind spinning. What kind of business? Kemi reached into her bag and pulled out a bundle of crisp notes. You will collect used panties from the villagers. Bring as many as you can. For every load, I will pay you handsomely. Salima's jaw dropped. Panties? she asked, confusion thick in her voice. Yes, Kemi said firmly. Don't ask questions. Just do as I say, and you'll never be poor again. With that, she handed Salima the money and turned to leave. Remember, she said, I'll be waiting. Salima sat by the river, clutching the money, her mind clouded with questions. What kind of business was this? Why panties? She didn't understand, but the weight of the money in her hand was real. And for the first time in her life, hope stirred in her chest. She packed her clothes and headed home her heart beating like a talking drum. What would she do next? The next morning, Salima woke up with a plan. She knew the villagers might grow suspicious if she asked for only panties. So, she decided to make her trade seem ordinary. With the money Kemi had given her, Salima went to the market and bought colorful buckets and bowls, big and small, each one shining under the morning sun. When she returned to the village, she knocked on the first door. 
an old woman opened, her eyes narrowing at Salima. Good morning, Mama, Salima greeted, holding up a bright blue bucket. I'm exchanging these for any old clothes, shoes, or even panties you don't need, the old woman grunted. Old clothes? Shoes? Panties? She shook her head. What kind of business is that? It's for a new venture, Salima said, her voice steady. If you have anything you're not using, I'll trade you for this fine bucket. The old woman's eyes lit up at the sight of the bucket. Without hesitation, she went inside and returned with a pile of old clothes and shoes, topped with a few worn-out panties. Salima smiled. Thank you, Mama. Here's your bucket. At each house, it was the same. The villagers eagerly handed over their useless items for Salima's shiny bowls and buckets. By the end of the day, her sack was full, bulging with clothes, shoes, and, most importantly, panties. That night, Salima sat in her hut, sorting through her collection. She carefully separated the panties and placed them in a special sack. The other clothes and shoes. She took them outside and burned them in a hidden spot near the river. The flames crackled, eating up the evidence, while Salima watched, her face glowing in the firelight. The next day, she delivered the sack of panties to Kemi by the river. You've done well, Kemi said, her voice smooth as silk. She handed Salima a thick bundle of money. Salima's heart raced as she clutched the payment. Thank you, she whispered, feeling hope rise in her chest. Kemi smiled, her eyes sharp. Keep working, Salima. Your life is about to change. And so, Salima's trade continued, each day bringing her closer to a life she never thought possible, while the villagers remained clueless about the dark secret hidden beneath her newfound success. Before long, the news of Salima's trade spread through Zango like wildfire. Her colorful buckets and shiny bowls became the talk of the village. From the eldest grandmothers to the youngest brides, everyone was eager to exchange their old clothes, shoes, and most of all, panties for Salima's fine goods. Have you seen Salima's new bowls? One woman asked her neighbor. Yes! I traded my husband's old shirts yesterday and got one. It's beautiful, the neighbor replied, her eyes sparkling with excitement. Whenever Salima arrived in the village with her buckets, a crowd would gather instantly. Women pushed and shoved, each trying to hand over their old items first. Salima never lacked customers, and her sacks were always full by the end of the day. With Kemi's payments coming in regularly, Salima's life began to change. She repaired her leaky hut, replacing the torn roof with sturdy palm leaves. Her windows were covered, keeping the cold winds out at night. She even bought new clothes, bright and colorful, like the women she once envied. For the first time, Salima could eat well. No more begging or struggling. Her days of hunger were over. The villagers noticed her transformation and began to talk. Look at Salima, they whispered. She's no longer the poor wretch we knew. Maybe her business is truly blessed, another added. But while her days were filled with laughter and trade, her nights held a darker secret. When the village slept, Salima would quietly gather her sacks of sorted panties. Like a shadow, she slipped through the narrow paths, heading toward the river. Under the moonlight, she would meet Kemi, who always waited with her strange, knowing smile. They exchanged no more than a few words, but each time, Kemi would take the sack of panties and hand Salima her payment. No one in the village knew of these nightly meetings. To them, Salima's success was a simple tale of hard work. But in the dark by the river, 
something strange and unspoken was happening, and soon it would catch the attention of a watchful eye. Salima's trade grew bigger than anyone in Zango could have imagined. She didn't stop at her village. Soon, she started visiting neighboring villages, her buckets and bowls gleaming like the morning sun. Everywhere she went, villagers eagerly gathered their old clothes, shoes, and panties, waiting for her next visit. Salima is coming tomorrow, they'd say, the excitement bubbling like a pot of soup. Everyone wanted a piece of her trade. Back in Zango, her life was a marvel. Her once broken down hut now stood strong and proud. Her clothes were fresh and her meals were satisfying. But while most villagers celebrated her success, one person's mind was restless. Her neighbor, Tinu. Tinu had always been a sharp-eyed woman and she couldn't ignore the strange pattern. Every night, while others slept, Salima would carry her sacks and disappear into the darkness. She would return hours later, her face calm, but her eyes told a story Tinu couldn't understand. Where does she go? Tinu wondered. One night, curiosity gripped her tightly. She wrapped herself in a thick shawl and waited by her window, watching Salima. As expected, Salima left her hut, a heavy sack slung over her shoulder. Moving like a silent cat, Tinu followed her, keeping a safe distance. The air was cold, and the night was eerily quiet. Tinu's heart beat loudly in her chest, but she pressed on, hiding behind trees and bushes. Finally, they reached the river. Tinu crouched low, peeking through the tall grass. Her eyes widened when she saw a figure sitting on a large rock by the riverbank. It was Kemi, her rich clothes glowing faintly under the moonlight. Around her, candles flickered, their flames dancing in a perfect circle. Salima approached, dropping her sack in front of Kemi. Without a word, Kemi opened the sack, pulling out only the panties. The rest of the clothes were pushed aside. Then Kemi began to chant. Her voice was low and rhythmic, like the hum of bees, and the air around her seemed to thicken. Tina's breath caught in her throat as she watched. Kemi raised her hands, and suddenly the panties vanished into thin air, leaving behind a faint, eerie glow. A strange laughter echoed through the night, sending chills down Tinu's spine. Her legs trembled and her heart pounded like a drum. She wanted to run, but her feet felt like they were stuck in the mud. What had she just witnessed? Who was this Kemi? And what was she doing with the villagers' panties? Fear gripped Tinu as she quietly retreated, her mind racing. She had seen enough for one night, but she knew this was just the beginning of a terrifying truth. Tinu's heart raced like a trapped bird as she stumbled back through the dark forest. The eerie laughter from the river still echoed in her ears, and every rustle of leaves felt like a hand reaching for her. She clutched her shawl tightly, her feet moving as fast as they could but the weight of fear made her legs feel like stone. She didn't stop until she reached her hut. Slamming the door shut, she bolted it and pressed her back against the wood, breathing heavily. The shadows in her room seemed to stretch and move, and the silence was deafening. Tinu sat in a corner, her knees pulled to her chest, her eyes darting around the room. Sleep refused to come. Her mind replayed the scene by the river. The candles, the chants, the disappearing panties, and Kemi's haunting laughter. She hugged herself tighter, whispering prayers under her breath, begging for the night to end. At the first light of dawn, Tinu could bear it no longer. 
she threw on her wrapper and rushed out, heading straight to the elder's house. Her bare feet slapped against the dirt paths, stirring dust as she ran. When she arrived, the elders were just waking up, their faces lined with sleep and age. But the panic in Tinu's eyes erased their weariness. What is it, Tinu? asked one of the elders, his voice heavy with concern. It's Salima, Tinu cried, her words tumbling over each other. She goes to the river every night. There's a woman, Kemi. She's doing something dark with our clothes. I saw it with my own eyes. The elders exchanged uneasy glances. What did you see? Another elder asked, leaning forward. Tinu took a deep breath, her voice trembling. There were candles. Kemi was chanting. She took only the panties and then they vanished. After that, there was laughter, evil laughter. The elders sat in silence, their faces growing more serious with each word. Finally, one of them rose. This is a grave matter. We must summon Salima at once. The village bell was rung, its sharp clang waking everyone. Men, women, and children gathered quickly in the square, murmuring among themselves. What's happening? they asked, their voices filled with confusion. When Salima arrived, her face was calm, but her eyes wary. The elders stood before the crowd, their expressions grim. Salima, the head elder began, your neighbor, Tinu, has brought a troubling report. She says she followed you to the river last night and saw things that concern the safety of this village. We demand an explanation. The crowd fell silent, all eyes on Salima. The air was thick with tension, and even the smallest breeze seemed to carry whispers of fear. Salima stood in the center of the village square her legs shaking like leaves in the wind. The villagers' eyes bore into her, their faces a mix of fear and anger. She swallowed hard, but her throat felt as dry as the Hamatan wind. Salima, the head elder said again, his voice sharp. Speak, what are you hiding? Salima looked down, her hands clutched tightly together. I, I can't, she whispered. I took an oath. If I speak, I will run mad or die. Gasps rippled through the crowd. Whispers rose like the hum of bees. An oath? What kind of oath? The head elder frowned and turned to one of the younger men. Bring the chief priest, he ordered. The villagers waited in tense silence until the chief priest arrived. His long staff tapping against the ground with each step. His eyes, sharp and knowing, scanned the crowd before settling on Salima. You've taken an oath, eh? The priest said, his voice deep and commanding. Salima nodded, tears streaming down her face. The priest raised his staff and began to chant, his voice rising and falling like the waves of a river. The air grew heavy and a strange stillness settled over the square. The villagers watched in awe as the priest's chants seemed to wrap around Salima like an invisible rope. Finally, the priest stopped and pointed his staff at her. Now speak, he said. The spirits will protect you. Salima fell to her knees, her body trembling. It's Kemi, she sobbed. She's not an ordinary woman. She's a ritualist. She forced me to collect your panties to steal your lives. The villagers gasped in horror. Our lives? Someone shouted. Salima nodded, her tears falling freely. Yes, she told me she would make me rich if I helped her. Every time I bring her panties, she performs rituals. She uses them to take your strength, your fortune, your very souls to grow her wealth. The villagers stared in stone silence, their faces pale. I had no choice, Salima cried. She said if I didn't take the oath and obey her, she would kill me. I was desperate. 
I, I'm sorry. The head elder's face hardened. He turned to the chief priest. What can we do? The priest stroked his beard thoughtfully. We must find Kemi and destroy her power. Only then can we break her hold on the village. The crowd erupted in a mix of fear and anger. The once celebrated trade of buckets and bowls had turned into a dark tale of deceit and danger. And now they knew the true cost of their old discarded clothes. The chief priest stood tall, his staff planted firmly in the ground. His eyes, sharp as a hawk's, swept over the gathered villagers. The square was so silent that even the rustling leaves seemed afraid to make a sound. This is no ordinary matter, the priest said, his voice echoing. A powerful witch hides among us, feeding on your lives through the work of Kemi. But fear not, the spirits have spoken and they will guide us to break this curse. The villagers shifted nervously. Some clutched their children. Others murmured prayers under their breath. Now, the priest continued, if you have ever given your panties to Salima, step forward. The curse cannot be lifted if you hide. For a moment, no one moved. Then, slowly, women began to step forward, their faces pale with fear. One by one, they stood before the priest, their heads bowed in shame and terror. Me too, whispered an elderly woman as she joined the line. I gave three pairs, admitted a young mother, clutching her baby tightly. Soon, more women came forward until nearly half the village stood before the priest. The men watched in stunned silence, their faces reflecting a mix of anger and fear. The priest raised his staff, Drawing a circle in the dirt around the gathered women, he began to chant, his voice deep and rhythmic, each word carrying the weight of ancient power. The air grew heavy and the villagers felt a strange pull, as if the very ground beneath them was alive. He called upon the spirits of the land, the river and the skies. The flames of the ceremonial torches flickered wildly and a cool wind swept through the square. The villagers shivered, though the night was warm. As the chants grew louder, the women inside the circle began to sway, their eyes wide with fear. Suddenly, the priest's voice rose sharply, and the circle of dirt around them lit up with a faint, eerie glow. The curse is breaking, the priest declared, but it will not fully lift until Kemi's power is destroyed. The villagers murmured in awe, but their fear remained. They knew that the battle was not over. Kemi, the witch behind it all, still lurked somewhere in the shadows, her dark power threatening them all. The chief priest, now armed with the full power of the spirits, closed his eyes and raised his staff high. His chants grew deeper, his words sharp like the blade of a hunter's knife. The air thickened and a sudden gust of wind circled the village square, lifting dust and leaves. The villagers held their breath, their eyes fixed on the priest. She is close, the priest declared, his voice booming. Her lair lies near the river, hidden beneath the old baobab tree. A murmur rippled through the crowd. The baobab tree was a place children were warned to stay away from, said to be cursed by dark spirits. Now, the truth of those old tales chilled their hearts. We must end this now, the priest said. Her power weakens, but she is still dangerous. Led by the priest, the villagers grabbed sticks, stones and torches. Their faces were set in grim determination as they marched toward the river. The once familiar path now felt darker, each step echoing with the weight of their mission. When they reached the baobab tree, the priest pointed his staff at the ground. Here, he said, her coven lies below. With a nod, the strongest men began to dig. 
It wasn't long before they uncovered a hidden entrance, a small, dark tunnel leading underground. The air around it was thick and foul, reeking of decay and magic. Bring her out, the priest commanded. Two brave men entered the tunnel, their torches lighting the way. Moments later, they emerged, dragging a struggling figure behind them. It was Kemi. Her once glorious robes were now tattered, her face twisted in rage and fear. You fools, she spat, her voice like the hiss of a snake. You dare defy me? You will all perish. The villagers recoiled, but the priest stepped forward, unfazed. He began chanting again, his staff glowing with a soft light. Kemi screamed, clutching her head as if the words burned her. Her power was fading. One by one, the villagers stormed her lair, smashing the charms, candles, and strange artifacts scattered inside. Each item destroyed seemed to weaken Kemi further, her screams growing fainter. Finally, the priest raised his staff. It is done, he said. She is powerless. The villagers dragged Kemi back to the square. There, they tied her to the old tree in the center, the very tree under which the village once held its joyous celebrations. Now, it bore witness to their darkest trial. You have stolen from us, the head elder said, his voice heavy with anger. You have cursed our people. Today, your reign of terror ends. Without hesitation, the villagers picked up stones, their fear and rage fueling their actions. The air filled with the sound of rocks striking wood and flesh. Kemi's screams echoed briefly before fading into silence. When it was over, the villagers stood in solemn silence. The witch, who had brought so much pain, was no more. The air felt lighter and the square seemed brighter as if the spirits themselves were relieved. The chief priest raised his hands. The village is free, he declared. But let this be a lesson. Evil thrives where greed and secrecy grow. We must remain vigilant. The villagers nodded, their hearts heavy yet relieved. They had won, but the memory of Kemi's dark deeds would linger forever. Though Kemi's reign had ended, her curse left scars on those closest to her scheme. Salima and Tinu bore the weight of their choices. For Tinu, her bravery came at a cost, her sight. The morning after Kemi's death, Tinu woke to darkness. The once bright world of Zango was now a void, and she cried bitterly. Salima, too, suffered. Her legs, once strong enough to carry sacks of clothes, could barely support her. Every step was painful, her body trembling under the weight of her guilt. The villagers turned to the chief priest once more. He performed rituals, chanting and calling upon the spirits. Slowly, Tinu's sight returned. She blinked, tears of gratitude streaming down her face as the village came back into view. But for Salima, the healing was not complete. Though the priest tried, her legs remained weak. Limping, she knelt before the villagers, tears falling freely. Please, she begged, her voice cracking. Forgive me. I was blinded by greed and fear. I never meant to bring harm to you all. The villagers watched in silence, some with pity, others with anger. Salima's sorrow was deep, but her actions had almost destroyed them. Salima's shame grew too heavy to bear. Though the villagers no longer cursed her name aloud, their cold stares and whispered words haunted her every step. She knew she could not stay. One morning, with nothing but a small bundle, Salima left Zango. She limped down the dusty road, her heart heavy. The village watched her go, their faces a mix of relief and sadness. Her name became a lesson, a warning of what could happen when desperation meets deceit. Parents told their children of Salima, 
the woman who traded their safety for riches. But while Salima left in shame, Tinu stayed and was celebrated. The villagers saw her as a hero. Her courage in following Salima had saved them all. Grateful, the king's son took Tinu as his wife. The village rejoiced, their hearts lifted by the union. Tinu's bravery was rewarded, and she became a symbol of strength and resilience. The story of Salima and the stolen panties became legend. Around fires and under the moonlit skies, elders told the tale to children, warning them of the dangers of greed and hidden evil. Remember, they'd say, evil often comes in the guise of opportunity. Though Zango returned to peace, the memory of those dark days lingered. The villagers stayed wary of strange trades and mysterious figures. Salima's name lived on, not as a curse, but as a reminder of lessons learned. And so, the tale of the woman who traded panties for riches became woven into the very fabric of Zango, passed down through generations, ensuring the village never forgot the cost of their trust. I hope you enjoyed the story. If so, please like the video, comment what you learned from the tale, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more enchanting tales just like this one. Thank you.